Hey, thanks, Linda. Uh, well, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the crops update meeting for uh, for this. Uh, I guess hopefully this spring fairly soon. And uh, what we have planned uh, with uh, South Parkland and, and with uh, the Southwest group was to uh, have a, a kind of a meeting where we could uh, try to get a hold, of, uh, get in contact with as many people as we could, and uh, maybe talk about a few of the issues that are maybe um, as current as possible right now and kind of happening. So um, we uh, tried to put an agenda together that hopefully we'll, we'll cover some of that. Uh, we, uh, we do have some interesting topics uh, for this afternoon. Uh, our first presenter is going to be Holly Dirksen, and uh, Holly uh, works for Maffrey and Carmen. And uh, she's going to, uh, I guess, give us a little bit of an update on uh, the club route situation in Manitoba. Uh, following her, we'll have uh, Doug Wilcox. Uh, he uh, works for uh, Manitoba Eggs. Services Corp for, for, for crop insurance and he will be giving us an update on some of the, the new changes to uh, crop insurance for this year. And then uh, to round off at the end we're going to get uh, Mike Wolitsky, he works for MAFRI as well and Mike's going to uh, give us a weather forecast for 2013 and uh, hopefully he's going to have a little better news for us than what we've been getting for the last little while and, and I was actually just looking on the five-day forecast and it doesn't look no heck either so and we're going to put uh, Mike to the test here and hopefully he's got some good news for us. So I guess with that uh, we'll, uh, we'll turn it over to Holly and uh, let her uh, I guess start uh, start the meeting off with a uh, presentation on the route. Great, thanks Lionel and good afternoon everyone. Um, as you can see here I'm going to be talking about Club route. Most I'm going to be focusing on the club route update um, based on the information that most recently was released. Um, but I also will go through the results of the Panola Disease Survey from 2012. And at the end, I'm also going to include a little bit about CONTAMS, which is a biofungicide for control of Claritinia in a number of crops that I've been getting a lot of questions about recently. Um, so to start off, uh, I'll look at the results from the Manitoba Canola Disease Survey. Um, I've separated this into the results in Manitoba overall and results specifically in the southwest region. Um, as you can see, our Sclerotinia levels across the province were about 65% of fields were infected. Um, the southwest region overall did have slightly higher levels than that. Um, black leg in basal infection, so that's right at the base of the soil line, was between 70 and 80% of fields and stem infections was just below 70. Um, overall, again, the southwest region, pretty similar to the original averages. And then Aster Yellows was our big disease in canola in 2012, where 95% of crops, canola crops, showed some level of Aster Yellows. Um, and again, the southwest region was right on the average there. Um, just to kind of show you how 2012 compared to some previous years, we kind of have had three years that were quite different from one, one another. Um, so in 2010, sclerotinia was our big disease, which isn't that uncommon uh, in Manitoba in the past, unless you just look specifically at these three years, and it seems to be um, uncommon and that it only happened in 2010. But sclerotinia in 2010 was almost at 90% of fields. Um, that was not unusual at the time. Um, so that was our big disease in 2010. In 2011, just due to a, a really large reduction in levels of sclerotinia overall, Black leg was actually our biggest disease in 2011, so that's that middle blue bar. Um, not really due to a great increase in black leg levels, but more just to a decrease in sclerotinia. And 2011 wasn't a big aster yellows year. Then, of course, in 2012, like I mentioned previously, um, aster yellows was the most major disease in canola. <clears throat> I'm just showing you now, I was showing you prevalence before, so that's the percent of fields that show some level of infection. In 2012, this is the incidence, so the percent of plants that are infected in a single field. Um, Sclerotinia, it was about, I think, 13% of plants that was the provincial average. Um, and again, Southwest region was right in there around the average. Uh, black leg, we're getting up to about 16% of plants in an infected field. We'll show some level of black leg. That's, again, the provincial average. Um, it seems in the Southwest region we are a little bit below that, but we're definitely getting to a level of black leg in the fields where we may start to see yield loss once it shows up in a field. 
Um, and then I can just draw your attention to the last bars there, the aster yellows bars. It may seem like a low number overall, that 10% of the plants in the field were infected. I'm sure many of you saw fields that had much higher levels than that. Um, but that is an extreme number as far as an average is concerned. Our previous highest average of incidence was 5%. So 10% so is a big jump. So that's why um, aster yellows in 2012 was a major problem. So now I'm going to get on to the major topic of my talk today, which is club root. Now the symptoms of club root, pretty self-explanatory, pretty large galls that can form um, on the roots of the canola plant. On the right-hand side, there's a pretty severe case of club root symptoms. And on the left-hand side, there's a much weaker case of club root. Uh, you'll notice the symptom is circled there with the red circle. And I want to draw your attention specifically to what a weaker case may look like, just because when we, we will see this in Manitoba eventually in the field, and when we do see it, it's not going to, like, to look like what we see on the right there. It's more so going to look like what we see on the left, very weaker symptoms. Um, so club root is caused by uh, Plasmodia fora brassicae. And the ideal conditions are warm soil conditions and high soil moisture. So definitely conditions that we get here in Manitoba. Um, there is the question, what about pH? It has been shown that higher pH soils may reduce disease severity, but they do not reduce the risk of clubber becoming established. There is a misconception that here in Manitoba, the pH in our soils is high enough that we're not going to have an issue with club roots, but um, that's not what recent studies have shown. And actually, fields near Brooks, Alberta, have had high levels of club root spores in the soils and the pH there is between 7.7 .7 and 7.8. Um, so definitely not what you would call acidic soil. Some facts about club root. It was, of course, first detected in Alberta, and that was in 2003. And of 2010, there was 500 infested fields. And the reason I brought up the 2010 number is just so that you can compare it to the 2012 number, where, where they are now over 1,000 cases um, of club root in Alberta. And I do believe that this number overall is probably underestimated. Uh, this is the most recent map of the infested counties in Alberta. As you can see, they're pretty localized around the Edmonton area, but there are some counties further south that have now had detections of club roots. Um, and then I just circled the ones there that are new since 2010. So in the last two years, um, those are the newer counties that have been identified as containing club roots. And you can see now that they are on uh, the eastern border of Alberta, bordering Saskatchewan. The resting spores of club root can survive in the soil for up to 20 years, um, which maybe you've heard that number before. So we got sclerotinia was bad at the five to seven year range, 20 years is obviously um, is extremely hard to rotate out of canola for 20 years. Um, spread via contaminated soil, so it is a soil-borne pathogen that's really the only way that it's spread. Um, and this is mainly the machinery, so whether it's agricultural machinery, um, the oil and gas industry, or construction equipment. So the spread of club roots. In Saskatchewan in 2008, there was a positive soil sample, but no in-crop symptoms. And that was in west central Saskatchewan. And in 2011, so that wasn't this past summer, but the one before that, you may recall hearing something about two confirmed cases in north central Saskatchewan. So those were actual symptoms um, on canola in the field. And it's important to note that that was in north central Saskatchewan, so not on the border with Alberta. And in Manitoba, um, we've had club root in vegetables. Reports actually date back to 1925. And more recently, there were some reports in market gardens in the 1980s. And in 2005, there was low severity symptoms observed in a canola nursery. Um, and that was actually in south central Manitoba. However, those plants were never sent in to be tested for club root. Um, so this, this was a vis visual identification of club root symptoms. Um, and also, that field has been tested. The soil has been sampled and sent in for testing. And each time, it's come back negative. So we haven't seen club root show up in that field since then. So club root in Manitoba. Uh, in 2011, so this was again two years ago in the soil survey or in the disease survey, two soil samples were identified as containing club root DNA, 
So there were no symptoms in the field and no symptoms on plants that were growing in the greenhouse, but they were termed non-symptomatic fields of concern. Uh, those fields, as well as neighboring fields and the fields that the growers normally go into after they've been in those fields, were all retested in the spring of 2012. Um, so about a year ago, because it was actually the snow was melted about a year ago this time, so it wasn't uh, much later than this that we went in and retested those fields. Um, and all of those soil retested soil samples came back as negative for club roots. So although we did find some DNA in 2011, we weren't able to find any more DNA in those fields in 2012. Um, we don't believe that it was a, a false positive. What's more likely is that it's just at very low concentration. Um, so the chances of finding it are kind of like finding a needle in a haystack. So we happened to come across it in 2011, um, but to go back and try and find it again is very difficult. Um, so the 2012 Canola Disease Survey. So this is the most recent results that came out. Um, in 2012, we surveyed 142 fields. And of those 142, we actually soil sampled 112 of them. And those soil samples get sent to the University of Alberta for analysis. And it's important to note that there was no visible symptoms of club root observed in any of these fields. So the results of our soil samples in 2012. Um, six samples tested positive for the presence of club root DNA. Um, but the levels that they tested at were all well below the store concentrations that would cause symptoms in the field. Um, it's estimated that approximately 100,000 spores per gram of soil are needed to show symptoms on canola plants in field. Um, of the samples that we sent in and were tested, one of them was at 2,900 spores per gram of soil, so obviously well below 100,000, um, and five of them were below their quantifiable range, which, is, which means that they are below 1,000 spores per gram of soil, so really at, at very low levels. Um, so those six soil samples that were identified were also tested via bioassay using highly susceptible brassica species. So they actually use um, a really susceptible cultivar of Chinese cabbage, and they take the very soil that we sent them, and they grow those plants in the greenhouse under ideal conditions um, to see if they get any symptoms. And two of our samples resulted in weak clubroot symptoms. So they are considered positive cases of club root in that we know now that what they were, we were detecting in that soil um, is viable and able to cause disease. However, it was under these ideal conditions. And we don't believe that this would cause disease in the field at this time. So what does that mean overall? Uh, we have four more cases of these non-symptomatic fields of concern, so the ones that showed the DNA but didn't show any symptoms on plants. Plus we have the two cases like this from the previous year. And now we actually have two positive club root cases. Um, the, all the growers that these cases came from have been notified, and the fields will be tested further um, in this spring. As soon as the snow melts, we'll be taking further soil samples and having them sent in for analysis. So what are some management tools we can implement for club root? One is to plant susceptible crops no more than once every four years. Now, I did mention that the spores are long lived in the soil, so up to 20 years. However, um, where we are now in Manitoba, where the concentrations are very low, something like rotation can help as far as not building up these inoculum levels in the soil. Uh, crop scouting, identify anything that looks suspicious. We especially suggest scouting areas of your field where uh, new soil is most likely to move in, so at your field entrances, uh, perhaps along fence lines or in any low-lying areas where maybe you have a drainage ditch running through your field. And then we encourage you to pull up plants that even are healthy looking because when the club root symptoms will show up, it'll be very weak and not necessarily affecting the upper portions of the plant, but there may be small galls that you can identify on the lower portions. Weed control, there are some weeds that are alternate hosts for club root. Uh, that includes wild mustard, stinkweed, and shepherd's purse. Uh, limit tillage, obviously, the more you're disturbing the soil, the better chance um, you could be transferring it from field to field. And use of resistant canola varieties. In Alberta, they are using these type of varieties. 
Um, and in areas where club root is well established, they're actually able to grow successful canola crops with these varieties. And the studies that have been done, done do believe that there is more than one type of resistance out there in these varieties. So it's important to rotate them to make sure that this resistance will hold up for as long as possible. Another big management tool that we're going to talk about is good sanitation practices, which isn't something that, that everyone likes to hear about, but it's important not only for club root, but really for, for any soil-borne pest. So it could be insect pests or weed seeds or a number of diseases that could be transferred through the soil. Rough cleaning, um, so that's scraping and brushing, will remove 90% of soil from the unit. If you follow that with a fine cleaning with a pressure washer, for example, that will remove 99% of soil from the unit. Um, and as a final step, disinfection will inactivate any remaining spores. So in areas of Alberta where clubbers is really at high levels, this is what is recommended for them. It's important to note that just disinfecting will not work. You need to actually clean the soil away before you get to that disinfection step. Um, here in Manitoba, because we are at very low levels, at this point we're even just talking about growers taking the time to, to kick the dirt off their equipment before leaving the field. So you want to make sure that you're doing this in the approach or the ditch of the field you were last in rather than going back to your yard and doing that cleaning at that time. Um, but another important thing here in Manitoba um, is controlling traffic on and off the farm. Um, so things like when purchasing used equipment, making sure that equipment is cleaned before it gets to your farm. Custom applicators. Uh, obviously, people get tight on time at certain times of the year. But it's important that custom applicators have some sort of protocol in place for cleaning their equipment. Um, you definitely don't want to be the guy that gave club root to all your customers. Um, oil field equipment. In Alberta, most oil companies uh, do have standards in place now for cleaning their equipment. Here in Manitoba, um, maybe less so, but there's definitely, as growers and oil field equipment coming onto your land, you have the right to ask them to clean it, and you can even ask to watch to make sure it's being done. Um, any road crews that are maybe disturbing the ditches in your area, uh, recreational vehicles, hunters, or ATVs, and agronomists, when we're out there scouting the field, we want to make sure we're parking um, on the roads and not in the field, and making sure that um, we're wearing either plastic booties or if it's dry and you're just wearing your shoes or your boots, make sure that you have maybe a bleach solution in a spray bottle uh, in your truck that you can spray down your shoes and boots um, after leaving that field before going to a new one. So some current research being done on club root. Uh, this is a list of resistant varieties. I realize it says 2011 Alberta Seed Guide. I believe I have updated it since then, but I couldn't find a really good list. So this is the ones that I, I know of. There may be more than this. Um, you may recognize some of those varieties as we do grow them here already. They are good yielding varieties. Um, we don't necessarily advertise them as club resistant in Manitoba because we don't need to. But it's important to realize that these aren't um, just lower yielding, maybe lower oil quality varieties. These are good varieties that we're actually already growing here. Um, and then also a name you'll hear a lot when you're looking at club root research is Dr. Steven Strelkoff at the University of Alberta. So he's doing work looking at analyzing the resistance that's out there in these different varieties and also looking at other management techniques that we could possibly use. We're very lucky that Alberta got this before us and they've been dealing with it for now for 10 years. So they've really got a lot of research on management options and they're to a point now where it's a very manageable disease there and we're able to learn from their example. So just some, a review here of the terminology I use um, in this part of my presentation, just because you may hear it again from time to time. Um, in order for, in Manitoba, for us to consider it a positive club root case, there may or may not be symptoms in the field, um, but we will have a positive DNA test and a positive plant bioassay. So that's that bioassay that's ran in the greenhouse under ideal conditions with a very susceptible um, cultivar of Chinese cabbage. It's important to note that that's the same criteria as the Saskatchewan for a positive club root case. But in Alberta, for them to be considered positive, they look for symptoms in the field. They actually don't send soil samples in anymore for a DNA test or a plant bioassay. Um, and then that second term there, that non-symptomatic field of concern, 
uh, were the only problem, province with a term for this type of, of field in that there was no symptoms in the field, there were no symptoms in the greenhouse, but there was a positive DNA test. We think it's important to continue to monitor those fields, um, and we're continuing to do so. So that's why we wanted to term them something. And then, of course, for it to be negative, um, we have notes across the board on the bottom. So there's just some conclusions about the club root part of my talk. Uh, Manitoba is no longer considered free of club root, unfortunately. And we're encouraging growers to use best management practices and avoid transfer of soil. Um, the Council Council put out this equipment sanitation guide that I encourage you to pick up or look for online. And for further information, you can go to www.clubroot.ca, which again is the Canola Council website, and I think they're in the process of updating it right now. So there should be all the latest information as far as um, where it's been detected in the other provinces, as well as clubroot resistant varieties and things like that. Now, I don't know if you want me to pause here for any questions on clubroot. Okay, um, I just ha I have a question, Holly. Um, in Alberta, have levels of club root gone down since the original areas uh, where they were found in the first round? As far as concentrations in the soil, I don't believe so, and it's definitely um, spread a lot from that those points. Um, and I think a lot of that is that growers maybe really weren't implementing all these equipment sanitation practices because there are areas, you know, right in the heart of the club root infested areas. There are certain farms that have still managed to avoid in club root on their particular farms because they are implementing equipment sanitation and managing all the traffic that comes onto their fields. But as far as levels overall in particular fields, I don't think they've decreased. Okay, that's the only question I have on club root, so. Lionel, did you have anything okay. you wanted to ask? Or? I don't know if Lionel has Holly, I, yeah, just one for you, Holly. Uh, if you go back a slide where you have the uh, Canola Council that came out with the sanitation guide, yeah. in there, does it have anything to uh, deal with uh, the oil oil field crews and that kind of stuff? Is there some kind of guidelines? Or, or I guess if I'm a producer, what do I tell them when they're coming on my land? I guess there, is there something in there that you can show them that this is what we want done? Or? Um, well, this sanitation guide will have that same information that I said about the rough cleaning will be 90% of the soil will be removed and the pressure washer will 99%, which is a very similar method to what the oil field equipment people should be using as well. So I think you could definitely you know, go through these steps um, and show them that this is what I expect of you. Okay, Holly, it's Linda again. I have one more question, and they want to know if you can use the pH for club root control. Um, no, we don't. We don't believe so. All the recent research, recent research has shown that um, club root can establish and even become severe in areas with with higher pH. Um, there's still still some chance up there that maybe it won't be as aggressive with a higher pH, but, but overall we don't believe that pH plays a big enough role that you can use it as, as a control method. Any other I questions? Have, I have no more questions, Holly, so go ahead. Okay. I think I'll just go on. I just have a few uh, points on content. So what's the deal with content? So I titled my first slide. Um, it's a biofungicide fungicide registered for sericnia suppression in a number of crops. Um, for field crops, that includes canola, sunflowers, edible beans, and soybeans. And it also includes a number of horticulture crops on its label, including lettuce, snap beans, carrots, cabbage, tomatoes, and celery. And how it works um, is, as I mentioned, it's a biofungicide. So it's actually a biological organism. Um, and that's its name there, Conothyrium minitans. And these, this organism actually infects Florosha in the soil of Sclerotinia, and it prevents the production of ascospores and mycelium. So there in the bottom I have a picture of a sclerosa, Florosha that has germinated um, and formed asco or apothecia. And that actually won't happen when 
source that has been infected with um, content. So how and when to use it. Um, it's a soil application, and ideally, according to the company's website, it's to be applied to infected stubble in the fall. So say you had a sunflower crop that had high levels of sclerotinia, and you want to just decrease the sclerotia load in your soil, you would actually apply it in the fall to that infected sunflower stubble. However, it also can be applied in the spring, so you can apply it to the sunflower crop that you are currently uh, planning on planting, um, but it must be applied three months prior to disease onset, so keep that in mind. And it does require soil incorporation within one week of application, but after that, the soil should not be disturbed again. Um, you're really, you're only really contacting the, the soil and they are the, the sclerotia in the top, I think they say five centimeters of the soil. So after you apply content, you don't want to go over that again and pull up sclerotia that are further down in the soil profile that you weren't, that the content wasn't affecting. Um, so that's why they say, you know, incorporate it immediately, but then you don't want to disturb that soil again. So does it work? That is the question I get, obviously. Um, here's a study that Vikram Bish, my colleague here in Carmen, did at the UM farm on soybeans in 2010. Um, I've only been in my position for the past two seasons, and obviously we've had two quite dry years with very low levels of sclerotinia. So I certainly haven't had much of a chance to see contents in action. Um, but this study that Vikram did, you can see on the bottom we have our different treatments. Um, control, oops, water, and a fungicide treatment. So the water was basically like the contents was being put on, on in the certain treated ones. The water was just being placed in the other ones. Um, that one's basically like a fungicide alone. And then the next one is contents alone. And the last one is contents plus a fungicide. Um, the purple bars represent the percent of sclerotinia in these plots. And then the blue line at the top represents the plot yield. Um, so as you can see, the best treatment, it seems, um, was combination of content and fungicide. And it did seem if you were just using one of them alone, it seemed that the fungicide was getting a better response in soybeans uh, than content alone was. But there's definitely a response um, as opposed to just the control. So um, some of the issues with content. Well, it works by acting on the pathogen itself rather than protecting the plant. And with things like sclerotinia, we know that those little mushrooms that are formed, when they produce those spores and shoot them up into the air currents, they can travel um, up to one mile. So although you may be preventing sclerotia in your field from produce, producing those mushrooms, if there are mushrooms in a neighboring field, they can still be infecting your plant. There's also a different mentality required by growers in that you're applying it for a crop you may plant two years down the road. So say you have a sunflower crop this past year that had a lot of sclerotinia, so you plant it this fall, so the next time you grow sunflowers or a sclerotinia susceptible crop, which may be two years from now, um, that you have some sort of control at that time. So it's definitely a different mentality than just applying a foliar fungicide onto the crop that you're trying to protect. Um, it's also somewhat costly. It's I couldn't find an exact number, but more than $20 per acre seems to be uh, the general consensus out there of how much contents cost. Um, and also keep that in mind that we really saw the best response when you were using contents as well as a foliar fungicide. So that's really you know, compounding your cost at that time. However, you can use reduced rates over time. So um, they do say that if you're applying it in the fall, that can even be a lower rate than what you would apply in the spring. And if you're using it um, you know, year after year, it's definitely you can reduce your rates over time. I guess to the point where hopefully you have very little sclerotia in your soil and are able to maybe only use it um, intermitt intermittently or not at all. So where do I personally see a fit for contents? Um, in the vegetable industry, such as carrots, where there are few registered products, there's definitely um, a fit for contents. Also, potentially, soybeans. Um, soybeans aren't as susceptible to sclerotinia as um, other crops, such as sunflowers or canola. However, it is a lot 
harder to hit that ideal timing for foliar fungicides in soybeans because you want to hit at the mid-bloom stage but before the canopy fills in. So it can be more difficult to hit the right time. Um, so contents may be a fit there for in, soy in soybeans. And then, of course, in sunflower basil rot, this type of an infection is only caused by sclerotia present in your field, not by sclerotia in your neighbor's field. So it's because it doesn't infect your plants through those mushrooms. It actually just mycelium grows directly from those sclerotia to the base of your sunflower plant. So there are no foliar fungicides that would ever work for sunflower basil rot. So something like a soil amendment needs to be used to protect against this. And that's all I have for contents. I just have a note here that during the growing season, don't forget to check out the Manitoba Insect and Disease Updates. Um, we post them weekly throughout the season. And we also encourage anyone that when they see an insect or a disease outbreak in their area, to make sure that they send in that information to myself or John Kowalski. Are there any other questions? I have a question here, uh, Holly. Uh, why the three-month window and what type of incorporation is required, i.e., is single pass sufficient? Um, the three-month window, I think they, there's a certain amount of time that you need this content to actually be acting on the sclerotia, and three months is really the minimum amount of time that you'd want that to be happening. So it's actually better to do it in the fall and give um, this bioorganism more time to work on the sclerotia. And I think, yeah, single pass, um, they don't require much incorporation. I've actually heard some studies where even if you get a rainfall right after you applied contents, that maybe you don't even need to go in and incorporate. OK, that's great, Holly. That's the only question that I have. So, Nope, that's it. That's OK. Lionel, is there anything else from you? Uh, the only other question I have, Holly, was uh, um, with the content, if you use it, say, for three or four years, like how long will it last in the soil uh, and give you kind of control? Or is it something that if you had a problem, do you need to be putting it on every once every four years? Or um, I imagine if you use it three, and four, three or four years consecutively, um, and then if the following you know, few years you don't see issues with sclerotinia, you can probably not use it and then only use it again once you see an issue with sclerotinia. Because if you aren't seeing an issue, it means that you've probably reduced the spore load um, in your field to a certain level. So you really don't need to use it again until that spore load builds up again. And you will only know that if you see an issue with disease in your field. Okay, well, that was all the questions I had, too. So um, thanks, Holly. That was a great presentation. Okay, thank you, Lionel. Okay, Lionel, uh, we don't have Doug on, um, but I think that Mike is probably ready to go, so. Okay. Um, can you uh, go to the screen there, then, Linda, and make him presenter? And I will kind of introduce Mike already, but... Uh, just to let everybody know, we're having a little bit of a problem getting uh, Doug Wilcox on the, uh, on the, I guess, on the system right now, and we're still trying. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Mike's presentation right now, and we're going to uh, get an update on uh, on his uh, preseason weather forecast, and uh, then hopefully we'll get Doug on after that, and we'll go to him. So for right now, we'll let Mike take over. All right. Thanks, Lionel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I have to revert back to what you said at the start, and um, Mike's going to provide uh, uh, the forecast for the entire 2013, and we'll hold him to it. <laughs> Those ones hurt because, you know, in reality, uh, the biggest thing about the forecast is we have these indicators with all these assets, and, and that's about really all we have. Um, it's kind of, in a lot of cases, um, more important to look back where we've been in the recent past. Um, as you know, uh, individuals, individual landowners themselves are going to uh, they're going to understand what's happening around their land, but sometimes it's really good to step back, uh, take a look at the province as a whole, or at least the southern part of the province, and kind of walk through what's happened in the last year to kind of obtain a running window as we go into the season of, of what's really happened. As you know, some of these um, these cycles that occur throughout normal and climate, um, 
some of them take multi seasons to work themselves through. So, and by looking back at the past year or so, we really see some of these contrasts, especially in different regions in the province. So, um, what I'll attempt to do quickly is, is most importantly, is look back at the previous year, and then we can kind of take a look at what's happening right now on the ground, and then really take a look at some of those big indicators that drive our climate, usually in the spring and moving on into the summer. Um, one of the big important uh, aspects of trying to ascertain what's going to happen is to take a look around in different geographical areas around um, the middle of the continent, just to take a peek at what everybody else is experiencing because um, some of those areas do influence our, our sequential weather later on in the season. So we take a look at some of those places. We won't be too surprised if at the end of the season, for instance, we wonder where all the precip was. So um, I'll walk you through it. Uh, we'll take a quick peek at the past and we'll get right to it. So my first slide, first I have to look at um, the winter of 2011-12, which really wasn't. Um, you guys in the southwest were coming off some good rain values for two, two and a half years of constant, uh, way above normal precip as we know through the flood also. Um, this is the map from last year from November 1st to March 28th. It's produced by Ag Canada and the good thing about this is um, all the stations that you'll see in Manitoba, um, the majority of them, we feed our data right to Ag Canada, so it's a good map to show and it's a good map to step back and look at what's to our west because believe it or not, uh, what happens to the west affects us also, including the south. So this is the November 1st of last year to March 28th and most importantly, you can see the southern areas of the province in the red. That's below 40% of normal. And as you recall, we didn't really have much of a winter last year, um, especially in the central and south areas. And um, there was no real snow cover to speak of. Uh, at the same time, Europe was in a, a freeze. So this is one of these situations where one of these small little cycles are overlapping on another bigger cycle. and. You know, even though we experienced nice warm weather and everybody was screaming at uh, global warming, you know, over in Europe they were freezing their tails off for the first time in a, in a bit. So we didn't get any precip. Um, it was a good break for you guys in the southwest. Uh, you had enough water. In some locations, um, they were still affected from that high water from the previous year. Even though um, we didn't really have a convective season last year and the rain kind of shut off in uh, the latter part of the growing season, and they were still affected, so this lack of precip um, kind of was a benefit to some people in the southwest. So no precip last year, definitely a marked change from this year, um, as we'll see in the preceding slides. Um, one thing I have to note is, here's a good example of how warm we were. This is from the monthly mean temperature from last February, and as you can see, the majority of the areas were three to five degrees above normal. Um, this time last year, I remember, I think we hit around 20 degrees um, Celsius in March, so things were really heated up quick. Um, we had no snow cover to speak of, really, so we lost a bit of moisture just there, just due to the fact that a lot sublimated and, and we lost it anyway, so February is nice and warm. Now, where was it? <laughs> this is, a, this is a, a graphic showing the snow on the ground last March 19th and you see the dashed line right located just in Nebraska there. This is the normal um, snow line for this time of year last year and as you can see there's just nothing. It's, it's receded all the way up to the top of the lake so no cover to speak of means this ground was wide open to evaporate even more precip. So for you guys in the southwest, sure some of you still had a bit of water that it was it was helping with the evaporation there in the south and central part and southeast. Um, this kind of exacerbated their their dry conditions from the previous fall. So we're starting to worry by this time last year about um, the lack of moisture and what was going to happen for the southeast. So big contrast from last year. Um, I'll quickly go through the growing season. A, a big thing about last growing season is just like 2011 for the eastern portions, um, everything kind of, we got a lot of precip in the early season, but things shut off after that. So this is a graphic of last year, April 1st to July 1st. And you can see in the southwest, it's 
around normal. There were some good showers in the early, even though the land was was ready to seed on early, um, we also got this nice precip. So things started setting off pretty good in the southwest. Although in the, you can see the Red River Valley in the red um, and to the east, just warm, warm, warm temperatures. So this is the growing degree days. You can see there was lots of heat around for that whole first part of uh, the growing season. Um, here's the average daily maximum temperature for July. And the reason I showed you that, uh, we had a lot of days that were well above that uh, threshold where plants are, are using the heat. You can see four degrees above normal for July, and this is the maximum. So we saw a lot of way above 30 days during July, and this kind of just set the stage for you know, the lack of precip for the rest of the season out in the east. So um, you can see in the southwest area that uh, you're only a couple degrees above normal, but it's still above normal. Now, the big important thing, the precip uh, combined with that heat started off. You can see in the west and southwest, uh, lots of rain. Some of the events that happened um, earlier on in the season, there were good amounts of rain, some good convective showers. Sometimes, in some cases, a bit too much rain. Uh, I remember Grandview receiving 90 millimeters in less than an hour. So some of those thunderstorms that whipped through in the early season really left a lot of water. And you can see that evidence up in the blue area up in the North Parkland region, which received in some cases up to 150, 175% of normal. So even though everybody was screaming in the southeast in the Red River Valley about the possibility of uh, lack of moisture throughout the rest of the season, um, north of Parkland, uh, they had lots of water. And they continued to, too. So that's April to July. Everything kind of changed uh, in the south after this point, as you'll see. Here's the percent of normal for July 1st to September 30th. And um, you can see the Red River Valley and all that region in the light brown area. That's, you know, less than half of the precip um, for the re remainder of the season. Same with around that Bertle, Hamiot area, too. Um, they got a bit more precip down to the south areas. Um, Sourist into the southeast in Clarney and uh, Boyce Savan also. Lots of good showers that came through. However, they didn't really materialize in the Red River Valley, so as you can see that. Um, although they got a bit of precip early on, it really shut off in the, in the Red River Valley uh, in July 1st. Boy, that's scary math. You can see up in Ethelbert, still 98%. So there's not one place on this map that had over 100% of normal for this period last year. So I'll run through the growing season um, charts just to summarize. This is the total accumulation of precip. And normally for southern Manitoba, 350 to 425 millimeters throughout this time period. So you can see the uh, up around the duck and north of the Riding Mountain, they received lots or sometimes too much precip. And you can see as we start to go towards the southeast, you can see the amounts diminish. Where we get to a point where only 150 uh, millimeters, which isn't much, only six inches for this period, throughout lots of the central regions and the south, uh, west and the southeast. So things kind of shut off from the latter part, July onwards. And, you know, when you look at the whole summary of the whole season, it doesn't really do it justice. You kind of got to break it down and look at those two periods that I just showed you. Um, here's the percent of the normal accumulation. Um, one remark about the normals. Um, as things start warming up globally and um, as time goes on here, and you know these normals are only a 30-year period. It's almost to the point where we need you know, 50 years of normals to make any sense of it. Just due to the variability that we've been experiencing the last three, four years, it's hard to make sense of it when you've got these normals that were you know, a bit more flattened in terms of their, their lines throughout the years. So there's the percent of normal precipitation. Uh, you could see that's 55% down in the dark brown. And the 100 is right around where the green changes the blue. So you can almost see that, draw that line of where all those showers from that convective season were farther north than where they usually are. They usually swath right across southern Manitoba. So Now the percent uh, normal accumulation of growing degree days. This is May 15th to September 15th, which encompasses most of the growing season. Um, it ranges from 95% all the way to 115. Now, one big thing I remark about this map is you can see up in the North Parkland, usually this, the big 115% are mostly around the, the south, 
central and the southeastern Red River Valley areas where you get 115. Um, this summer, it was all about the uh, parkland and, and Hamiota northward who got the big values. Not too much along the uh, Saskatchewan border, Swan River area, but just uh, a line right south down from the Duck Mountains eastward there. You can see the big uh, values. So. Um, CHU, much of the same as GDD, lots of um, high percentages up in the northwest. Um, just so you know, to note that anomaly with that's down in the southern portion is up in the hills, and same thing with the uh, with Sagaming, so they're kind of a bit misleading, but it shows for those locations that are in a bit or a higher elevation um, what kind of values that came out of those places. And everything kind of changed uh, September 23rd where we received our real first significant frost, and this is a map of, of the minimum temperatures throughout the southern province. You can see everything was pretty well done by this day, and believe it or not, uh, the 23rd is right around the normal time of the first frost, so um, things abruptly ended right about there in September. Um, now, for the people in the central areas in the southeast, they got a bit of a respite in October, and things were looking a bit grim in terms of water levels and moisture levels in the soil. October kind of changed everything. Um, you can see the blue areas, they're up to 100 millimeters, which in some cases it's three quarters of what they received through the whole growing season. So this kind of restocked some of these areas um, back for their moisture. And believe it or not, that, that, that four or five inches came down and it was sucked right in and evaporated almost immediately. So it was needed and the good thing about that, things started to cool down right after that and we we got some good moisture in the ground. Um, you can see not too much in the southwest, but by then um, things were pretty good. So we're right up to the, the fall season. Now I must remark that um, it's definitely a different fall this year than last year again. Um, uh, we started cooling down really quick. This is the temperature deviation from September, October, and November. And you can see we're below normal in southern Manitoba, so things um, really cooled down. It, uh, it gave a chance for some of that those places that needed the moisture to lock it in for the coming winter. And we did get a, a bit of a snow layer in those dry areas immediately after that big rain. And it locked a lot in. So all of a sudden there was a bit of optimism there that, hey, maybe we're not too bad off depending on how the winter is. But here we go for the September, October, November percent of normal precipitation um, throughout the whole prairie. As you can see that we're around normal for southern Manitoba up until this point, up until uh, December. So we got a bit of that moisture put back in. Um, some places got a bit too much moisture uh, around the lakes and uh, up in the northwest, obviously. But it is what it is. So definitely marked from last year. Uh, those areas that needed the precip got it. Now to the south of us. Um, uh, even though uh, things down there have been dry as anything for the last two, three years, um, it's really important that we take a look at it. Uh, we get a lot of our summer moisture from the Gulf of Mexico region. And as things dried out last year, it, it really does affect the amount of moisture that overall gets brought up from that huge moist air mass and dumping on southern Manitoba. So it was kind of the second year straight where uh, dry conditions in the south kind of translated into less precip in some regions for us later on in the summer. So here's September to February. Um, for the states, and you can see to the south of us, which everybody watches, especially for the floods, um, they're near normal. Um, taking a look down in Texas, uh, they were still, again, below normal. This is probably, I'd say, at least the 25th, 26th month in a row where I've seen below normal, especially in West Texas. So everybody's keeping their eye. 2012 was the warmest summer on record in the U.S. Um, usually after about year three or four, they start to get a break due to these big uh, global oscillations, but they haven't yet, and things aren't really looking that good for them coming up, as you'll see. So that's to the south of us. You can see that uh, um, northern, uh, northern South Dakota uh, was really dry, and same with Nebraska, really dry. They've been replenished a bit, as we'll see, but you know that whole big swath from, from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to Manitoba is dry, and you know as those air masses are, are driven 
northward with its moisture, and it, it just doesn't translate in dust. If it doesn't, if there's no moisture, it's not getting dust, and you can see all this dry area all the way through there. Scary. So let's look at this winter. Um, we got to fall. We got a bit of a snow cover. Here's November 1st to March 11th. And this is the percent of average precipitation that the whole prairies have received. And once again, um, uh, Ag Canada is getting the measurements from our 25 snow gauges throughout the province to help aid with this graphic. And you can see um, things are looking pretty good for the uh, southern areas and the southeast areas, which are received between 85 and 115 percent of, uh, of water equivalent uh, weight. You can see it ranges all the way up to 150 up around the Dauphin area, and then we've got a big slice west of Dauphin of an area of 150 percent. So although we usually receive about 115, 130, 140 millimeters of water throughout the winter, um, we haven't been seeing it in the last couple of years. So just to see it again is, uh, is uh, welcome to some of the southeast. Sorry about that. Let me go back. Um, just one point to note, um, some of the people in the earlier in the season were concerned about uh, the sewerist watershed and the shellmouth. Uh, you can see things are loading up. Uh, that whole region around Moose Jaw is really lit up with above 200% of normal. So um, this is logging up, and March isn't even done. So um, to try to talk about the spring melt, it's just too early right now. But you can see that uh, seeing this much snow in Saskatchewan is probably a bit... Uh, scared a bit of people to the south of them for sure. Now let's look uh, in January, the snow on the ground. Uh, things were starting to look good. We had our snow cover. You can see this area just in the Red River Valley that didn't have too much snow by January. Um, once again, the dashed line is the, the normal climatic um, line of where the snow line is for this time of year in January. And you can see it was a bit shy in terms of precip. Um, these lines are one, five, 10 um, centimeters, 25 centimeters. You could, so you can see there, there was a snow cover south of us, but a tad sparse. Now here's 12th of March uh, this year, snow on the ground. You can see that all of southern Manitoba's got a good cover. There's a bit of a weak spot just where it was earlier in January where there's just barely much snow cover, all the way up to 60 uh, centimeters up around your region in the southwest. Same. With the northwest, a nice good snowpack, and you can see Saskatchewan with varying amounts with those big high amounts right around there. Um, to the south of us, you can see that it's pretty normal in terms of where the snow line is for this time of year. So things are, as you can see, proceeding into the spring. On the snow side, um, things are pretty normal. Now here's an American graphic of the snow depth. And this was produced uh, yesterday, and this is mostly satellite. But you can see the blue is uh, 50 centimeters, so you can see most of southern Manitoba has uh, anywhere around 25 to 50 in most areas. It's really hard. Snow is one of the hardest parameters to get a handle of, especially in the prairies. Um, snow advects everywhere throughout the Red River Valley especially. And as you guys saw this uh, this winter, usually when you get a good snow, it's there's wind also, so to try to measure that, you, you see you're measuring blowing snow also. And snow that's been invected in from other areas during the event too, so it's really hard to judge. You know, one good thing we can say is that uh, there's more snow than there was last year. Um, the drought situation down south, uh, everybody's been watching it for the last two years. and um, We saw the failure of the corn and everything else throughout the Midwest. Um, this graphic is the North American Drought Monitor, and it was produced uh, February 28th, and it was released on March 11th. So this brings us up to the end of February. And you can see the red, that's that's good hard drought all throughout Nebraska, and carries all the way down. There's been some alleviation in, around the panhandle there, but not too much. This is, once again, it's two and a half years of seeing lots of red down to the south. So the people in West Texas are really hurting. Now this is the forecasted uh, situation down south, and it's good to take a look at this once again for the reasons I mentioned, but it, you can kind of extrapolate it into southern Manitoba. And as you can see in uh, North Dakota, this whole area that was in the northern side last year was all brown and uh, very dry. 
Now throughout, obviously, with the snowpack that we've got to the south of us, you can see that they're forecasting some improvement. Now, these products really fluctuate from week to week, and, and it's really event-based because, uh, as you know, in, in Nebraska, it can all of a sudden go up to 3, 4 degrees above Celsius, and then everything melts. So um, things change really quickly in terms of the, the forecast for the outlook for the drought. But you can see the whole area that we're concerned about to the south of us, there's forecast to be some improvement throughout, at least out to the May 31st. So in most cases, that gets everybody planted. So um, whether or not that translated, it's one of the indicators that says that, well, maybe it's not going to be too bad down south. But as you can see, persistence throughout all of Texas and north of there, it's just been a big brown collage for the last two and a half years. So um, they're hurting down there. Now, as I get into some of the predictions for this spring, um, historically we've only gone by basically just by climatic situations, i.e. Uh, we take a look at the 30 years and we use climatology to figure out what we possibly will happen for the spring based on seasonal change and everything else. Well, nowadays we've got uh, satellites, models, people are looking you know, at global rotation. And this just gives a, a, a bit of a, an example here of, of how intricate this whole process is. Um, this graph is just for um, our friend down south in the Pacific that usually results in El Nino and La Nina. It's our big driver for, besides climate, we really look at these global circulations to get a grip on what we think is going to happen because they do affect our weather. So there's a lot of eyes always down south to watch the big end, so in the, in the, the oscillations that happen down south. And this just shows you on the right-hand side all of the models that are used in some of these ensembles. So this wasn't around 50 years ago. So we have more than just climatology to go by. There's a lot more things that are thrown into the mix. But as you see by this graphic, you can see how, how up and down some of the forecasts are. So sometimes all this uh, deduces down to just uh, you know extrapolation where there's the middle line. And everything's looking the way it is. is uh, the spring and summer, we won't be affected by either El Nino or La Nina. They're just not present. Um, there's no real indicators that anything's happening down there. So because of that, it, 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 it doesn't really give an indicator to show us what the summer's going to be like. But at the same time, it scares the models into not really knowing what's going on. So although it kind of uh, keeps the models away from distinct indicators to say more rain, less rain, blah, 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 these kind of things, that uh, they, they kind of flatten the curve off and make it just equal. So it is what it is, but you can see it's pretty complex, and this is just part of it. Um, we have been affected. One of the things that El Nino and La Nina do do is they throw off the climate cycles, and places like the Panhandle get less rain than usual. So by having a neutral situation down south, it kind of takes that out of the prediction anomalies for uh, the remainder of the season. So what we'll do now is we'll look through the, what's Environment Canada saying for the uh, short-term outlook and the long-term outlook. And we'll also take a look to our friends down to the south to see what they're saying. It's really good to contrast the two because obviously if they're both bang on to each other, then we have a bit more confidence on what's going to happen with forecast. When we start seeing them diverge a bit more in what they think is going to happen, then we kind of have less confidence. So we'll go through them quickly just to take a peek to try to get in the back of our mind what we expect maybe that will happen. So um, this product is Environment Canada, and this is the temperature outlook for March, April, and May. And as you can see, all of southern Manitoba is above normal, warmer than normal, for the period March, April, May. So far, it's not really happening. Now we'll look at the uh, Americans, and they're forecasting for the same time um, equal chance of above or below. So there's no real indicators for them that we're going to be above or below. But to the south of us, and this is one of the reasons I like seeing this, is we keep an eye to the south of us. We see what's kind of materializing down there. And I have to say that, once again, these three-month outlooks, um, the above normal temperature and the below normal precip for the southern U.S. has kind of been a staple throughout, once again, for the last two and a half years. So you can see that temperatures are forecasted to be well above normal throughout the, the Midwest and the, the Panhandle. So dry, 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 it's just going to exacerbate things. Um, now here's the precip outlook for March, April, May. 
Um, there's no indication that we're going to be anything but normal. There's a little bit of a blue to our southwest, um, which indicates below normal. But other than that, there's no real big trigger to say um, lots of rain. Now, this is the three-month outlook for precip for March, April, May by the U.S. Um, you can see a little bit of above normal just uh, out in northwest Ontario, but otherwise, um, equal chance above below. Um, what's good to see on this is a bit optimistic that um, all through the Midwest is kind of that big brown area is gone from that. So um, maybe there's some optimism there to, that we'll get some good early season precip to the southwest. Um, temperature outlook June, July, August. I must remark that things get really scary. There, there's what's uh, called a, a, a spring binder that kind of throws the models off right around this time of year where um, just due to seasonal change and everything else, it's, they're a bit less confidence on going out to June, July, August at this time. In a month's time, they'll have a way better handle. But here's what it is. Um, the red is above normal throughout for June, July, August. So they're forecasting another hot late season. Now the precip, as you can see, oh sorry, this is temperature of the U.S. and you can see the southeastern area of Manitoba's got a bit of a above normal for precip for that late summer, but mostly there's no indication of uh, anything but normal. And Canadians for June, July, August, uh, you can see there's nothing there on the board to indicate up or down or above or below. Now the U.S., uh, the big thing I'm remarking about this graphic here, this is uh, July or June, July, August also, is the precip probability. And you can see a lot of that brown is alleviated from the southern U.S. So, you know, kind of the indication there is that it won't be as dry as, you know, it was last year at least. So that's the first window in the models that I've started to see that the amount of below normal precip is kind of, um, retracted and gotten smaller um, to our south, so the Midwest is all no real indicators of low normal. Um, I'll shorten the span a bit and take a look at the, the near future for what's going to happen. Um, this is a precip accumulation model, and this one takes us out uh, 240 hours to the next Saturday. Um, in southern Manitoba, the brown is 20, 20 to 25, 30. So you can see there's some precip in the next uh, couple weeks coming in, mostly to the south. Um, usually when I look at these models, I look for the, the big amounts that are close to us because, as you know, things can change. But other than that, it's looking um, like we're going to see some precip in the next uh, week and a half, two weeks. That's the Canadian model. And let's move on to the America model. It's the same time frame it takes us out to next Saturday. And this one um, contrasts the slight where they've got a, a bit more of a precip field to the south of us where you're seeing lines of uh, uh, up to two inches. So there's the Canadian model doesn't really um, show this big field. So this is kind of a bit concerning. So maybe we'll get more precip than forecasted. But that's a that's a, definitely a contrast between the Canadian model for that same part, time period. Um, I'll zoom it out a bit for the American model. And it goes a bit longer. And it takes us all the way to the end of the month. Um, there's that big precip field to the south of us. Obviously, this is accumulated throughout the whole period from now till the end of the month. So there's some forecasted precip coming into the south. Uh, 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 and that's usually an indicator of a few clippers or some Colorado lows that are expected to form up. So we'll take a look. But that may be good, may be bad for the people down south and for us also. That's a lot of precip. Um, that's about all I have for the update for the spring. Um, April's just around the corner. It's a bit too early to really talk about planting conditions from my perspective. It's just anything could happen. Um, you saw by the models with the, some of the contrast that um, we could see a heck of a lot of spring uh, precip uh, or we could just be normal. Um, one thing we do have to note is we'll keep an eye on the snowpack because that could change everything. A nice slow melting with nice cold nights is ideal. Uh, it might still happen. Uh, you saw from the what they're forecasting for temperatures above normal. Maybe that might not happen. So I think all these uh, factors combined, um, it's just too early to tell about early spring, but you've seen the indicators for the remainder of the season. 
nothing really indicating us to us that there's going to be anything but normal, at least up until July. Uh, confidence really drops off after that, so um, I take it with a grain of salt after that. And that's about all I have uh, for you, unless anybody's got any questions. I guess, uh, Mike, just, you know, the million-dollar question. Like, you're saying that maybe not a flood in the spring in Southwest, or there's a possibility, or... You know, well, I guess that's it, a concern. You know, I can't really, we, I can't really I, comment on the flooding side, but what I can comment is, 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 you know, how much snow is on the ground and how much we've had and and how it was doing prior to that. So it's really hard to tell. If if we have a nice slow melt up in those large areas of precip that I showed you in uh, in uh, central eastern Saskatchewan, if it's a nice slow melt and everything's working with the dams and everything, then perhaps it'll be minimized. Um, it, you know, on the other turn where this, we could get warmer temperatures and it could melt off and then, you know, we could get that big blob to the south of us. So, you know, it, nothing's conclusive in terms of, uh, especially when we talk about a month from now. It's just too early. But all those conditions are starting to, to add up and you watch it, you know. And if we do get those warm temperatures and nice clear skies and with cold nights, then possibly through sublimation of the snow cover, um, a lot of it could just be given up to the atmosphere. So um, it really depends on how things work its way through in March. March is the big kicker month for us to how things are going to materialize for the next month or so. So in a way, it's too early to tell. I know that doesn't leave you very optimistic, but um, it is what it is. Mike, I was uh, looking at the long range here for the next week, and they're calling for southwest anywhere from kind of an accumulation of anywhere from 10 to 20 more centimeters of snow. Does, have you heard, this, uh, heard the same thing? Or? Yeah, I just showed you the model that goes takes us out to next Saturday, and, and there was an area of uh, 20 there. So, yeah, it's possible. But the one thing that I wanted to show you guys is that um, when I showed the America model, there was a lot lar uh, larger... Um, field of more accumulation to the south of us. So, and they're conflicting models right now. If anything, there is precip coming in up till next Saturday. How much? Um, these these quick moving spring systems, uh, like the Colorado lows and the Alberta clippers that come through, they're very hard to predict. They come through very quick, and uh, just their velocity alone, uh, you know, they're clipping along very fast. They're hard to forecast. So. If you're on the on the warm sector side of that low as is coming, then you're going to get a lot of snow. If if you're staying in the cold sector, you're not. So, um, everybody knows that in the springtime, um, the forecasting is a bit scary for these lows, just due to the fact that they whip through um, our area and our region so quickly, and they're so they're gathering so much energy that they're very unpredictable. So yeah, there's precip coming. Any other questions for Mike, Linda? No, I don't have any questions, and Doug has joined the webinar now, so. Okay. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, uh, kind of, uh, I was looking for the crystal ball, and you gave me a faded or a blurry crystal ball look, so, <laughs> but I know it's hard. Oh, that's our job, Lionel. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done. Okay, thank you. I guess with that, uh, Doug Wilcox has joined us uh, from MASC, and uh, Doug's going to talk uh, a little bit about some of the updates for this year, and uh, then a little bit about the Yield Manitoba book that's come out. So, Doug, if you're there, you want to take it away? I'm trying to use speakerphone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can Go you ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. we can hear okay. you. Go ahead. All right, and you can see the screen clear. Yes, okay. we can. Go ahead. And I'm hearing an echo. Or are you hearing an echo? Yeah, you're going to have to maybe mute the, uh, I'm not sure whether it's on your phone or your computer. But yes, we are uh, getting feedback. I was on hand-free, so I was out of that. So you're on your phone, Doug? Now I'm on the phone. Is this better? Okay, well, you need to mute the computer then. Uh, it is. Okay, go ahead then. Okay. 
Um, today's presentation is uh, about uh, MAF 2013 programs and using Yield Manitoba. Um, we'll start by looking at our uh, program participation levels so far. Uh, coverage is around uh, two and a half billion dollars and uh, and that's a high from what we've historically been closer to uh, a billion and so uh, it's a big change so if we had a complete wipeout in the entire province we would be at uh, paying out 2.4 million 2.4 million billion dollars so hopefully we never get that far, but uh, certainly it gives you an, an idea of how much insurance we provide provincially. Uh, that $2.5 billion of coverage is provided on 9.5 million acres, and uh, the premium we collect on that is nearly a quarter billion dollars. In 2012, we, we expect our uh, payouts to be uh, $175 million which is substantially less than 2011 when it was uh, $326 million. If we look at our uh, cumulative fund balance, which is a blue line over time, compared to the premium income we collect, you can see that uh, in recent years where we've suddenly had a big decline in our fund balance, even though we were in a surplus position for many years. And as a result, we're having to uh, provide a slight surcharge on premiums to recover a surplus, because we would like the blue line to be roughly one year's premium more than the current premium we collect, so that we have a buffer. If we look at our agricultural loans, as you're aware, MASK is more than just uh, agri-insurance. Uh, and the loans are for producers and rural businesses, uh, giving them short-term financing for various programs. Uh, soccer loans are, are for short-term financing for feeder cattle and calf purchases. Uh, comprehensive refinancing loans are those provided to uh, producers that are in financial difficulties. And then we have emergency assistance programs, such as the hog assistance loans and the BSE recovery loans, uh, which are still ongoing, even though they aren't ongoing programs. We still have people uh, paying back those assistance programs. And uh, so the, we pay out roughly, or we have in 2011-12, roughly $107 million in uh, direct loans and uh, in assistance programs, roughly uh, 50 million. If we look at our loan guarantees, which are sort of the hidden aspect of our loan business, uh, in our loan guarantee programs, uh, loans made by private sector institutions uh, are uh, subsidized or, or guaranteed by MASC to assist uh, producers in obtaining credit and uh, getting reasonable terms. And so many producers don't know they have loan guarantees when they get a credit union loan, uh, but they actually do. And that's roughly half our loan business. And uh, we have roughly $80 million in loan guarantees outstanding in 2011. Our bridging generation programs, uh, support to intergenerational transfers to farmers under 40. And the programs we have in that uh, component are uh, the young farmer rebate, the management training credit, the 90% finance option, and the interest only option. And uh, the young farmer rebate reduces the cost of borrowing by 2% for the first five years of a young farmer loan. Uh, the management training credit gives producers 1% off the principal amount if they uh, enroll in training. And then the 90% finance option and interest only options are flexible financing options offered to uh, young farmers. And as you can see, 
most producers opt for the 90% financing option instead of the interest-only option. Some changes that were made recently to our lending mandate, uh, not last year but the year before, but are worth mentioning that uh, many people are unaware of, is that we are now offering higher lending limits. Uh, we're allowing $2 million for all types of applicants. Our eligibility criteria have been removed for all mask loans, eliminating the net worth cap, eliminating the off-farm income limit, eliminating the farm housing cap. And we are now offering equipment financing, and more specifically, loans to purchase new or used agricultural equipment. So basically, we are getting more competitive with uh, the uh, private sector side of lending. In regards to mass kale statistics, uh, we offer a, a product that is competitive with uh, private sector hail products uh, out there. Uh, in addition to our agri-insurance, and this is an uns unsubsidized program, so it's got to be self-sustaining. And in that program in 2012, we had uh, $850 million in coverage provided, insured uh, 5.1 million acres, and collected nearly $30 million in premium. And we paid out nearly $20 million in payouts. Uh, we currently have close to 60% of the hail business in Manitoba, so we are the major player in the province when it comes to uh, spot loss hail insurance. If we look at our hail insurance program history, the red being the reserve fund and the black being the premium income, you can see unlike agri insurance where the reserve fund has dropped below our premium income, hail insurance continues to be above our premium income, and as a result, we have discounted our hail premiums to reflect the fact that we want to drop this surplus. So producers are paying less for their hail premium than they otherwise would in a different financial situation. We also offer wildlife damage compensation program, and in 2012, uh, as of the end of December, we paid out nearly 600 million in big game payments, uh, 160 million in bear and honey payments, uh, nearly 75,000 uh, in terms of leafcutter bees, waterfowl 499,000, and predators 875 thousand dollars for a total of 2.2 million dollars in compensation program payments, which have probably uh, increased since the end of December. So getting to the meat and potatoes, uh, the update for, 200, er, for 2013. Uh, the big picture is uh, higher insurable values and probable yields have occurred. There's, on average, amongst all the crops we insure, uh, there is a 13% increase in unit values, a 0.2% increase in probable yields, a 1.2% decrease in premium rates. The net effect being that the premium goes up by approximately 12% all overall, which means producers are paying more premiums on average, but the bulk of that is because they're getting a higher coverage as a result of higher unit values. In regards to program enhancements for 2013, we're looking at, at new insurance test areas, open pollinated corn and insurable as silage, no variety restrictions for lentils, expanding the pasture days insurance pilot program, overseeding is now acceptable as a forage restoration option, and higher hail insurance dollar selections. Uh, a program change that would be considered negative by some is that aerial seeding is now not insurable. In the past, if you uh, seeded crop by airplane and it did achieve adequate coverage, we would insure it. Uh, however, uh, we've had, uh, well, there'll be a slide covering that coming up. In regards to insurance test areas, on a trial basis starting in 2013, crops that previously were not insurable in some areas, these are dry edible beans, grain corn, lentils, open pollinated corn, soybean and sunflowers 
are now insurable province-wide in the new insurance test areas. Coverage in the new area is 80% of the lowest coverage in the existing insurable areas for that crop. Further, there are no extended seeding periods in the insurance test areas. So the major deadline is the final seeding deadline for those crops in the test areas. Looking at a soybean test areas map, basically all the new green area is new. This is the new test area. And just because we're insuring it, soybeans in the PAW and other areas of the province that would be considered marginal, doesn't mean it's recommended that you grow them in that area. It simply means we're prepared to provide it some sort of insurance. And the insurance we provide is at a much lower probable yield. Uh, it's 80% of the next or next lowest uh, eligible area. So in the case of soybeans, in area three, the coverage is 24.9 bushels per acre. In the test area, the probable yield is only 20, or 80% of 24.9. And your actual coverage at 80% would only be 80% of that. So producers in the green that are new would only be entitled to a soybean probable yield guarantee of 16 bushels an acre, but at the same premium that the producers are paying in, uh, in risk, or not risk area, in uh, soybean insurance area three. So they're paying a higher relative premium rate. They're paying the same premium for 20 bushels per acre as someone pays for 25 bushels per acre in area three. OP corn as silage. Open pollinated corn that is used for silage is now insurable as silage corn. OP silage has a lower probable yield than hybrid corn silage. And so if an produ insured producer grows both open pollinated corn and hybrid corn silage, the same coverage level must be selected for both types. And all production will be combined for the purposes of determining the claim. And the lower probable yield for OPC silage is 50% that of grain corn silage. The Pasture Days pilot program has been expanded for 2013. And it's only expanded in two agencies, and that's Dauphin and Nipawa. We're allowing up to 20 producers in from the previous three producer limit. And that's to see what the market demand is. Uh, we're not comfortable that if we were to open up the pilot program to the entire province that we would have high enough participation levels. But to, to test that out, we are testing in two agencies whether if we put a good push on the program, whether we can get at least 20 of the potential 40 or 100 or whatever that are in there. The purpose of the program is to test the concept of ensuring against a pasture production shortfall over the course of the grazing season based on having to remove livestock from pasture or provide supplemental feeding earlier than normal. So it's, instead of a probable yield, we have a probable days on pasture, which our provincial average is 130 days, and we use that as the basis of that program. In regards to overseeding forages, overseeding of damaged forage crops now qualifies for the forage restoration benefit. In the past, you had to destroy damaged forage crops in order to get forage restoration. Now you have an overseeding option. And for both forage establishment insurance and the forage restoration benefit, if a producer overseeds a damaged forage crop, the indemnity level is 50% of coverage, with the remaining coverage continuing in force until the earlier of the destruction of the failed overseeded crop, or June 25th of the following year. It should also be noted that the deadline for filing a forage restoration claim is September 30th, with late claims subject to a late fee being accepted until October 15th. In regards to our hail, or our spot loss hail, program, there's hail dollar increase changes. Dollar selections on a per acre basis have increased 
to up to $200 for most crops. And then for the specialty crops like potatoes, uh, up to 750 And for vegetables and strawberries, up to $2,000 an acre. Hail insurance is now available for all insurable crops, regardless of whether the crop is selected for agri-insurance. In the past, if you wanted canola hail insurance, you had to insure canola under agri-insurance. That is no longer the case. You still have to have an agri-insurance contract. So if you wanted canola hail insurance, as long as you had your wheat insured under agri-insurance, you could have that. Aerial seeding coverage stops. Uh, we're no longer allowing aerial seeded crops to be eligible for insurance. Why? Well, we've had limited success with it historically. And administratively, it's difficult to tell uh, aerial seeded canola from volunteer and other crops. Broadcast seeding, however, by ground, continues to be insurable, provided the crop establishes to a level that is equal to or greater than the insured's coverage. Now, what was unique in this year is that we also had approval for changes for 2014. It's unprecedented. We've never had an approval a year in advance for some program changes. And those changes are, we're in 2014 proposing a new suite of forage programs, a premium hay, basic hay, flood option, disaster benefit, alfalfa quality option, plus continuing the forage establishment, forage restoration benefit, and pasture insurance programs. We're also proposing to eliminate stage one coverage for winter wheat and fall rye, and that starts with crops seeded in the fall of 2013. And in turn, that means that producers insuring winter wheat in 2014 will have up to 40% less premium cost as a result of removing the stage one benefit. The November 30th deadline for selecting EMI options is new as well. Uh, if you want to uh, buy down your deductible, for example, you'll have to do it in the fall and not wait until the spring. Same with land added to a contract. Uh, we won't allow changes in June, for example. You have to do any changes in land by March 31st, or it won't be eligible for EMI. Just some more details on the forage proposals in a very general sense. Uh, we're completely revamping our programs in an effort to provide more effective risk management options and increased participation. Uh, our annual crop insurance levels are close to 90 percent, but uh, not insurance participation levels, pardon me, for annual crops are close to 90 percent. Whereas in our forage programs, our participation levels are only 15 to 20 percent. So we're looking at completely removing our old programs and bringing in new in the hope to increase participation. Some of our new programs being proposed are a premium hay insurance program to replace the current tame hay program. And in that program, we would recognize age of stand being greater than four years old and four or less years of age. Uh, also would be uh, eliminating offsetting between various forage types. So alfalfa would be standalone, alfalfa grass would be standalone, grasses would be standalone in terms of insurance. And uh, we would continue our quality guarantee in that program. Basic A insurance is uh, a, n a newer option that's supposed to provide a low cost option and a simple option for producers who want to simply insure a base tonnage of winter feed. Uh, it has no quality guarantee, and in simple terms, it, if you normally harvest 900 bales, we would guarantee 900 bales, and we wouldn't care about the types or, or that sort of thing. The hay disaster benefit will provide higher compensation in years where there is a serious hay shortage. We would look provincially at the amount of hay losses there are, and if it's a significant enough event to trigger our trigger, then we would simply top up all hay claims with an additional dollar amount to reflect the fact that there's additional trucking costs associated in that year with the shortfall. Uh, course, a flood option 
that would be is also being thought contemplated and it would provide uh, insurance for flooding separate uh, from our regular programs for course hay which is uh, sort of our native hay replacement so if you want protection from flooding in your native hay you would have to buy this course hay flood option so we have sort of a, a user pay option being contemplated we're also looking at for the cash hay and dairy hay producers a quality option for alfalfa to provide extra qual quality coverage to producers of high quality hay and several components of uh, the former forage programs including forage restoration benefit forage establishment insurance pasture insurance and pasture days will likely continue so let's just get some background on this 2014 elimination of stage one for winter wheat and fall rye why are we doing that well we've had excessive payments for this crop with excessive reseed incidents and there's also the moral hazard risk of signing up at the end of winter for winter kill losses and uh, so if we look at winter wheat losses over the period 2000 to 2009 the average percent of reseeds for winter wheat are on the order of 13.6 percent but that contrasts with crops like red spring wheat and canola where it's less than one percent so there's excessive amount of reseed payments in winter wheat and so it's a, dis a crop that's distinct that way additionally when we look at cost of production we can look at establishment costs seed fertilizer pesticides fuel etc in the establishment year and that works out to roughly sixty dollars an acre but under our current program where you can get a receipt benefit of 25 percent and a stage one benefit of 50 percent or 75 percent of coverage in all you could could receive under the current programs in 2012 in this on f12 soil if you had a winter kill loss you could receive 213 dollars an acre and in 2013 you'd receive $281 an acre but you would only be out of pocket $60 per acre so we feel that that's our compensation is too generous so we are proposing that uh, well we're proposing for 2014 that stage one will be limited eliminated for uh, winter wheat and fall rye so that we're only paying what's highlighted in yellow here which is the receipt benefit which is 25 percent of coverage which is in the 70 to 90 dollar range in this example which is much closer to the 60 dollar establishment cost so if you're interested in mass products contact your local mask insurance or lending agent or visit our website now in regards to using yield manitoba it's been published as a color insert since 2000 comes out in mid-February as a free publication it's commercially funded no cost to producers or taxpayer but how do you use the data the variety yield information listed in the yield Manitoba ta tables is on farm yields reported to mask by producers from their respective risk areas and in order for variety information to be listed there must be a variety name and it must be sown by at least three producers on a minimum of 500 acres the yields provided are net yields derived from adjusting the gross yields reported by producers on their HPR for moisture dockage and test weight which producers also provide additionally when there are measured yields for mask appraisals or claims those yields will override the reported net yields for yield Manitoba purposes the yields presented are not adjusted for grade and destroyed acres with no appraisal are reported with a yield of zero and alternative use acres with no appraisals are just ignored and are not reported one of the key things to keep in mind when looking at these reported yields is we're not looking at scientific trials management and environmental influence have not been standardized 
So you need to use caution when doing cross-variety comparisons, particularly when there are limited acres or years of information. However, and the fact that they are on-farm results is also a strength of the data in that they are under on-farm conditions. Cross-variety comparisons from the yield Manitoba data are most meaningful between varieties grown on large acreage over many years. And to make the best selection for your farm, it's recommended that you use the information in yield Manitoba with other information sources, such as Seed Manitoba. So here's an example from 2013 of canola provincially. And what's provided in yield Manitoba is the last five years of yield information. In this case, 2008 to 2012. And for the last two years, we also provide acreage information. And uh, you can see that the top variety in Manitoba for acreage is in vigor L150, growing on nearly 862,000 acres. However, we only have two years of it, the data for it, whereas the second most popular variety, 5440, we have five years of data. Uh, another thing to note is that uh, for many of the crops, we also list their herbicide group, like Liberty Tolerant or Roundup Tolerant, as a sub-label. So that information can be useful as well to people interested in classifying varieties that way. Uh, we consider yield Manitoba information important info. Yield is what makes most growers their money. Cost of production is largely fixed once you decide to plant an acre of crop. So anything you can do to increase yields without increasing costs increases profitability. That could be selecting an appropriate and high yielding variety. That's why it's critically important that variety growers choose their varieties wisely. Uh, however, it's also important that uh, producers not be afraid to switch varieties. Uh, any time lag between an improved variety's availability and its acceptance can result in profit or loss. Another thing to keep in mind is to look at multiple locations, not just the location close to your farm. Varieties which perform consistently across various locations are preferred over varieties which only respell, respond well at a single site even if that site is near your farm. And that's basically because growing seasons everywhere are highly variable and not much weather happens at other sites in the province that couldn't happen at your farm. So one site data is probably not the best uh, reference. In addition to uh, selecting varieties, you can use yield Manitoba data to benchmark for success. Top producers are always looking for weaknesses in their enterprise to take corrective actions. With Yield Manitoba data, producers can compare their operations to their neighbors' results without the coffee shop inflation that may occur when you're uh, talking to other producers. Also with Yield Manitoba data, producers can pencil out accurately the most likely results from growing new crops or varieties in their area or in new areas. So what if, what if producers as a result of yield Manitoba are picking canola varieties or management practices that yield them one bushel per acre more of canola on average? What would be the provincial impact of that? Well, let's say there is 3 million acres of canola in the province at one bushel per acre times $13 an acre. That means $39 million additional to the Manitoba economy alone from the availability of the information in Yield Manitoba. And that number can be inflated more if you consider all the crops for which Yield Manitoba may be helping with producer decisions. So we think Yield Manitoba information is important. So thank you. Good luck in 2013.
Any hey, questions? Doug. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Doug, I have a couple of questions here. Um, somebody is asking for clarification that if you rent land after March 31st, will it not be eligible for EMI? Starting in 2014, no. Okay. Um, where can you get Yield Manitoba booklet if you did not receive the Manitoba Cooperator? Uh, we provide extra copies to uh, Go Center offices and to uh, crop insurance offices. So they should have some copies they can share. It's also digitally in PDF form on the Management Plus website for those who would like to just get it off the web. Or as a final resort, they can contact me and I will send them a copy. Okay, and at what point will MASK consider writing off a winter wheat crop in the spring, especially given a lot of the crop given had emergence problems last fall? We will write it off when we feel comfortable that the crop has no ability to recover. So that varies depending on the growing, the spring season. Uh, how soon it's out of the ground and how much and how rapidly before we can go in and dig up plants and look at the roots and see how viable the plants are. Certainly we know that many crops that don't emerge in the fall or in the case of winter wheat, emer emergence in the fall isn't that important. Uh, there's hardly a crop that gets planted in the fall that doesn't uh, grow again in in the spring. So we suspect that in many cases the crop will recover, but we will go out and do an assessment and see. Okay, and uh, one last question here. Are you currently doing pasture insurance in other areas and how are the producers selected? We are doing pasture insurance throughout the province and uh, but it's on a limited basis to three producers per agency, and I believe it's on a first-come, first-served basis, uh, provided you're eligible for the pilot. So if they're interested, I guess they can contact their local agent and see if there's an opening available. Okay, uh, thanks, Doug. I have no more questions. Uh, Lionel, did you have anything? Uh, really, the only one would be maybe a bit of a comment uh, the uh, regarding the insurance on the rent of land uh, that might put a, a little bit of an issue for some producers that maybe are picking up some extra land uh, earlier or you know renting it later in the spring and stuff like that so yeah uh, all that means is you're not entitled to EMI it doesn't mean you can't get insurance we're talking EMI with that additional land after March oh okay uh, the question, I guess, kind of threw me off there because they asked for insurance, I guess. But okay, so they'll still yeah. be eligible for insurance then. Right. Perfect. Yep. Good. Well, uh, if there's no more questions, um, just going to my screen here and. Uh, give you some final information as to if you want to get a hold of this office in CIRIS. Uh, the uh, webinar was recorded and you can and will be able to watch it later or if you know somebody else that would be interested in it, they can watch it later. And uh, so that's the contact information for myself and for Linda. And then this is the contact information for the FPAs in Southwest and South Parkland. You have Elmer working out of the Show Lake office, uh, Murray and Brandon, Amir and Hamiota, and Andrea in the Verdon office. So if you have questions regarding any of the uh, information you heard today or you're looking for a Yield Manitoba book, I think we do have some in most of our offices. We don't have a lot, but if you didn't get one, uh, contact the office and I'm sure we can find one for you. I just, guess with that, just one uh, comment, Lionel. Natalie, Sorry, Lionel, just one comment mm -hmm. that we also have uh, Melissa Atchison in Melita is an FPA. So. Oh, sorry, right. Melissa is back from maternity leave. 
and she's in the Millet office. Sorry, Melissa, I forgot to, forgot to put you on the slide. And uh, I guess with that, then we will uh, end the webinar for today, and uh, we'll uh, let you know when we're having another meeting like uh, similar to this in the future.